So, so the material we talked about uh, both uh, first off uh, yesterday in terms of reactive flow and permeability dynamics and behavior with sorbing media uh, really defines the fact that we'd like to know what fluid, gas or liquid pressures are within these reservoirs and what the stresses are because those are the controlling variables. And if we want to be able to understand how those evolve in time, then that's kind of the object of our uh, interest in being able to, to look at the progression of fluid pressures and stresses within these, these reservoirs. And so we've dealt with the first part of that in terms of permeability behavior. And um, at least in terms of steady state, yesterday we talked about both the magnitudes, uh, how we calculate pressure changes in steady state in one-dimensional and two-dimensional systems. And we have this generalized relationship to define that behavior. And uh, we also extended that to be able to look at the 2D case and a, the, the simplest form of an element that we can have in either of these cases is this behavior that we dealt with yesterday, which would be just a single element that has on it, the simplest form of the variation. And so just to recap, uh, if you recall, what are we, two, four? Two, four, I think, yeah. Um, if you recall yesterday, we talked about having individual elements that have a very simple form of shape functions along them. And if we plot magnitudes of heads versus location, I guess this is something we did do yesterday, was that we had a head at node 2, a head at node 1, and defined over a length of this element that we had here. And the simplest form of this uh, variation was this behavior. And we could chart it out as the head at any point is equal to the head at node 1 um, plus the location along the length of the element, head at node 2 minus head of node 1. And this was the simplest form of a, of a kind, we could break this into a shape function if we so wished, but we didn't actually to do that. And so the, the outcome, I think, of what we talked about yesterday was that we ended up defining a system of equations, which was something like, we didn't write it out this way exactly, and the system of equations was that we were interested in being able to define a conductance matrix. And we know that that conductance matrix always looks like this in terms of these two properties, key properties, two matrices, I guess, rather. And uh, for at least for our two-dimensional element, which was this triangular element, was also uniformly defined in terms of this behavior. Uh, what, were the, what were the forms of these matrices? They were something like dh dx, dh dy, for at least the two-dimensional case. Squiggly bracket is equal to this A matrix times nodal values of head. So for the triangular element, it looked like this, h1, h2, and h3. And so in other words, it's something that links nodal values of heads. So in other words, our shorthand for this was something like h comma for these derivatives is equal to a h. And so we know how to get this for at least some specific uh, 
assumptions of this shape function. You remember that the whole essence of getting this A matrix was defining a head distribution on this, which was something like, well, I guess it was A plus BX plus CY, right? This was how we did this. And so this sh uh, shape function, if you like, or distribution of the variable within the element, the head in this particular case, was really the essence of how we ended up coming up with this A matrix. So that was one of them. And the other matrix was the constitutive matrix. And the constitutive matrix says that uh, velocity of flow is equal to uh, D matrix multiplied by dh dx, dh dy. In other words, I suppose if I do that, I might as well do this. This is vy and vx. Didn't draw that very well. But this constitute, this is Darcy's law. So those are the two, two components we need for this. Um, and so that's the, where we are really starting from. So what we know about the system is that any particular system we want to deal with, this is, this is always true. This is always correct. Uh, and that's good because we've already got it. It's good because we know that matrices that have this A transpose DA part, especially the A transpose A, have to be symmetric. They have to be uh, positive definite. No zeros on the diagonal, usually with a strong diagonal, diagonally dominant, and they're actually quite easy to solve as a result. Um, and the form of the matrix we got, we've made the case already that the form of this A matrix is directly a result of our choice of this kind of shape function. And we're not necessarily restricted to that. It's convenient that both in the one-dimensional case and in the, the three-noded element, the simplest forms of variation are actually a linear variation. Linear along the element, in this particular case for the head variation, and linear as a plane surface which overlays it in the case of a tri triangular element. But we might be interested in being able to have different variations of head within the element to be able to accommodate uh, uh, more interesting uh, behaviors in these systems. And so that's what we'll talk about now, is how we um, deal with the behavior with so-called isoparametric elements. And isoparametric elements is merely, would be the industry stand, standard. And so when we look at uh, ComSol, as we did briefly yesterday, uh, we'd see, for instance, that the elements that they use are so-called isoparametric elements. Uh, and the idea is relatively straightforward. And so we'll work through these three things in terms of what the big picture is in terms of what isoparametric elements. We'll do our obligatory one-dimensional example, and then we'll start talking about how we implement that uh, example uh, using numerical integration. And so this is the basic idea, I think, in, embodied in, in this. And so if you can imagine a, um, a well, and in this well, you're pumping fluid. Actually, you can draw it right here. This is the well here. I can draw it here. And say you're pumping fluid in or out, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then being able to represent that in one way would be to take a mesh that in three dimensions was just this tapering um, slice of cake, if you like. And you could represent the mesh in 2D by using triangles, as we talked to yesterday. Um, and we might want to arrange the triangles so that, since we know that the variation of head away from this boundary, because the fluid is flowing as it goes through here, it has to have the same volumetric flow rate. So as it goes across a cross-sectional area that becomes smaller and smaller, then by definition, the head gradient has to change with radius like this. It has to be steeper close in, and it would be less steep as you go further out, just like this is shown here. 
And the reason for that is that we know that Darcy's law links velocity to this. We know that because we have the same flow rate in a steady state going through every single section, if the section gets smaller, then the flow rate here has to be larger than it is here. If the flow rate here is larger, sorry, the flow rate is constant, Q equals constant, but the velocity is equal to Q divided by the cross-sectional area. The cross-sectional area, I've already kind of messed this up a little bit. The cross-sectional area of flow, if we drew it on here, would look something like this. This would be the cross-sectional area of flow. And clearly the cross-sectional area of flow, as you get closer to the well, gets smaller and smaller. And so if the cross-sectional area of flow gets smaller and smaller, then the velocity here will be much less than the velocity here, which will be much more. If the velocity here is larger, then by definition, if this is larger, this is constant, then this has to be larger as well. And so that's just rationalizing the fact that we'd have a high gradient close to the wellbore, and we know that. And so by way of saying that, my reason for mentioning that is that we'd like to, if we have a higher gradient, maybe we want to have more elements to cover the, that area, to be able to pick up this high gradients. And so if we're using triangular elements, what we could do is we could make this mesh, which would have these larger number of nodes here. So this would be a single triangular element here, this would be a singular tri single triangular element here. So that would be one way you could do it. The alternative way you could do it would be to dream up some elements that instead of having to be comprised of all of these uh, subordinate triangular elements, we could make a quadrilateral element that merely had extra nodes in it that were able to pick up the variation. So in either case, uh, the distance between the nodes as you go out, which radially would be, would be larger, smaller distance here, than it is as you get further out. It's kind of the same net effect. But isoparametric elements are these ones on the left-hand side, which are geometries which are different from the, the very simple triangular element that we have, and a bit more elegant, and are the ind industry standard. And so the desire is that we can have a flexible meshing scheme that allows us to be accommodate this um, higher meshing to be able to pick up these high uh, gradients. And of course, you'd run the model to be able to see what the results are. If you're worried about whether the results were right, then you'd use a denser mesh and see if you get the same results. And if you do, then you know that you have a solution to, to your problem. And so the question is, how do we get these isoparametric elements? and What are they? And the, the concept, I think, is relatively straightforward. So I'll talk in, in an overview about what the concept is. And this is the, the, the basic concept. And so the concept is that you have this non-rectilinear element that has some geometry attached to it. It has nodes at which we would prescribe uh, heads and fluxes. Uh, and what we'd like to be able to do, you remember that this is the relationship which defines our conductance matrix. It's an integral that we have to do. And so what we could do is instead of trying to calculate this difficult integral over this irregular area, which is not so obvious, you remember that when we talked about the triangular element, if you remember, then what happened was we could just write this as, uh, let me write it up here, k is equal to a transpose dA integral dx dy. We could take this out because for the triangular element, I guess I should make the case that this is the triangular element, these terms are all constants. They're just a single value in each location within the matrix, and so they're constant. And so we could take this stuff out of the integration and do the integration just on the area. It's a triangle. It's very simple to determine. If we use isoparametric elements, it gets a bit more complicated for two reasons. One is that if, for instance, the distribution of heads within the element is not linear, then when we take the derivative of it, which is what goes in this A matrix, then it won't be a constant. It will actually change with location within our element. Uh, 
And so we can't take this matrix relationship outside the integral sign anymore. And also when we do the integral, then because it's an irregular geometry, it's not going to be a simple uh, area of the triangle. So this, this, this just ended up being the area of the triangle, you remember, right? Thickness times the area of the triangle times delta. And so those are the two issues that we, we come up against. And so if you want to use these more complicated variation of heads within the element, you have the two problems that no longer is a constant and no longer is the integral a very simple integral because the contour is, is larger is different. And so the solution is this. You try and map from this irregular geometry onto very regular geometry, the so-called bi-unit square. Bi-unit means dimension 2 in each, each side. So 2 wide, 2 high, and for the three-dimensional problem, 2 into the page as well, uh, but not in this case. And so you do your calculation after you map it, and we map it using this function here. This is called the determinant of the Jacobian. Determinant of the Jacobian. <coughs> Sounds very grand. Um, determinant just means uh, it's the same property we calculated yesterday in inverting these matrices. Jacobian just means that it's a matrix of partial differentials uh, that we use for mapping. A Hessian is a matrix of second order partial derivatives. Jacobian is first order, so it's just a, a convention. And so we use this to map it from this irregular geometry to this geometry, which is a, a regular geometry. We do the calculation for this, this matrix here using these terms in this form. And we don't actually really reverse map it back because we, we kind of have the result already. But you can think of it as doing the, the calculation in this form and then mapping it back somehow to be able to get the, uh, the conductance matrix. This last step we really don't do. Once we've got this, we, we have it. And so let's look at the, what that might, uh, what we mean by that. Again, by using some examples. Um, there are a variety of labels of these uh, elements. Um, isoparametric is the, the generic name that's uh, applied to it. And so it comes from the Greek, I think. Iso is single, one, one. Um, and the, the meaning of it is basically this, is that when we do the mapping, so in other words, when we map from this real geometry, which would be on a plane, into this calculation geometry, what we want is that every single point within this element goes only to one single point within the, the transform of ISO means single. And so the best way to illustrate what that means is to illustrate what would uh, violate that. And what would violate that was if we, we mapped this geometry here and the mapped geometry looked like this. Because now this single point in this geometry would include, I guess, this point here and also a point inside it. Well, I guess I'm making the point of this. Or this node here would represent both here and here. Right? So in other words, two, two points on this original global geometry, once you map it, become a single point. And that violates this principle of this one-to-one -one mapping because it's ambiguous now. So that's what isoparametric means. Um, there are some other classifications as uh, subparametric. and super parametric. Uh, and I probably shouldn't have mentioned that because I can't remember uh, exactly what they, uh, they, they refer to. They're, they're referring to the fact that uh, if you imagine that you have um, uh, the, if you imagine that you have an element that looks like this is not straight-sided but has curved sides. It's not just my bad drawing that I'm doing here. I'm trying to make this actually a curved element. If you imagine the fact that you have magnitudes of displacements 
at the nodes that are mapped with relatively simple shape functions, which are simpler than the shape functions that describe the geometry, then it's subparametric. And if you imagine an element that has straight sides on it, and where the displacement, say the d degrees of freedom that describe behavior, um, are actually more complicated than the, the shape functions that do the mapping, mapping of the geometry. So say we had displacements here in y, ux, and ui. Maybe become more apparent exactly what I'm trying to say later. But basically the idea is that in each of these elements, what we'll do is we'll use shape functions to map both the variable, which is either the head or the displacement of the element. And we'll also use those same shape functions. We could use those same shape functions to map the geometry. Um, we could choose to use the same shape functions for both of those tasks to map the geometry and to map the nodal variables. Or we could use different shape functions, one that's more complicated, higher order, and one that's lower order. And so sub and super parametric is referring to the fact that in this case, we're using a, uh, a higher order shape function to, to represent. So this is higher order. So say quadratic shape function. <coughs> for geometry, lower order for uh, variable. So the variable would be the displacement, or the head is really what we've talked about. So that would be this, this top one. And in this one, we're using. Uh, so this would be, say, linear. We talked about quadratic and, and linear. And this one would be that we're using higher order. It's the opposite. Higher order for variable and lower order for the geometry. That's nothing we have to, to worry about. It's just a convention. So the bottom line is that what, what we're going to do is we're going to use the shape functions we talked about, and we can use those shape functions to map two things. We can map the variable over the element, and we can map the shape of the element. So in other words, clearly, if you want to be able to, for instance, populate a disk with elements, you could use a lot of individual straight-sided elements, which would represent that behavior, or triangles for that matter. Or, in which case, if you blew this up, then you'd see that you know, if you're using a, a straight-sided element to represent a curved boundary, then depending on your radius of curvature, you're not quite matching it in this region here, right? But you could devise elements, and we will devise elements, for instance, that had actually a curved boundary to them. And it's not just my bad drawing that's curving these boundaries. It would actually have a quadratic uh, boundary that would fit exactly this, the curvature of this disk, which might be uh, a well bore, for instance, that we might be interested in. So that's, that's the idea. And so, what do we mean exactly by this, this mapping function? If we go back to this, we made the case that what we would like to do is we'd like to have some uh, function that allows us to map from this geometry, where this, I guess, is equal to 1, to this geometry, and this is just this mapping. So what does this physically mean? Well, basically what it means is that what we'd like to do is instead of working in the x and y coordinate directions, which I didn't point out, is that this integration is also now done locally in terms of these local r and s coordinates. So instead of integrating in x and y, you'll see that this has been changed into this. And so what do we physically mean then by this transformation that takes 
this portion of the unmapped geometry and map it into to this. Well, straightforwardly, it's, it's basically this. It's really not a very difficult concept. This is really the idea, is that if you think of uh, your element in, in this geometry here, in x and y, then this would be a little differential area, which is dx dy. If you map it onto this, then uh, so this is the elemental geometry, which is dr ds. It's basically saying what do we what scalar value? This is a scalar. What scalar magnitude do we have to multiply this area by to get or to get this area? I guess what scalar do we have to multiply this area by to get this this area here? That, that's all it is. So that, and the easiest way to illustrate that, I think, is, is this very simple idea down at the bottom. Uh, instead of working in two dimensions, let's work in, in just one dimension. And the idea is what we had before is this element, this is our global element, which was of length L, right? And so by uh, analogy with this, we talked about this by unit square, right? This is minus 1 to plus 1 uh, on both sides. And so if we do the same for this uh, isoparametric element in, in 1D, then it would be minus 1 to plus 1. So in other words, if you take a little bit of, of this and think of this as being dx, the equivalent portion of this would be a small bit of this, which would be, I can't really draw that small, but this would be of length ds, no, sorry, dr, right? And then if you link these to, together, this is the expression we'd have, right? We don't have this extra term here, we lose that. And then if you look at the full length of this, the full length of dx here is going to be equal to 2, sorry, is equal to L. And the full length of dr on the whole thing here is equal to 2. And so this Jacobian term is just the, the ratio of the two lengths of the system. Length of the global divided by the length of the, of the local mapped component. And so it really isn't such a, a scary term. It's a scalar value, which we've made the case for here. And we should be able to figure out exactly what it is. It turns out we don't want to just use this whole length of the element uh, as ratios to do that. Because you could imagine that if it was a complicated geometry, the mapping wouldn't be one-to-one -one everywhere along the element. It might be different at one end, more at one end than it was at another. But we'll, I think that will become apparent to us as, as we go down. Let's do a one-dimensional example just to cement the idea, because it's really not, not so scary, I don't think. So this is the idea. So we'll go back to our one-dimensional geometry. We'd expect, of course, that when we come out with this, that the conductance matrix for this, since it's really no different from the other case, is going to be area times hydraulic conductivity divided by length, and it's going to be plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. That's what we had before. This is kind of the same geometry we're dealing with here. So there's no reason why it wouldn't, uh, shouldn't work out to be very similar to that. So this is the idea. This is our normal element of length L. It has some cross-sectional area A. It has some hydraulic conductivity K. It has uh, two nodes, one and two. And at these nodes, we have a head. And I guess we also have a a flux, if we think about it as well, which are Q1 and Q2. Um, and this is our real geometry that we're dealing with. Our map geometry is that we want to uh, shoot this down, if you like, so that this ultimately goes to here, and this ultimately goes to here. And this is now minus 1 and plus 1. Again, nodes 1 and 2, at which we'd have heads 1 and flow rates 1, 
and heads to and flow rates to. That's merely it. And instead of being length L, it's now length 2, right? This, the dif distance between these, these two nodes is now 2. This is our uh, global relationship, hydraulic conductivity. This is just the length of uh, the, the, the x-axis is along the element. We get rid of the volume part just by taking the area outside. And then we have A transpose dA. In this transform geometry, we have the same cross-sectional area, but now we replace this term here by this mapped term, which is just this, this scaling relationship. So that's so what we'd like to be able to do is be able to work out exactly what these components are uh, in terms of, since the integration is in terms of R now, this new coordinate, then presumably we also have to define the A matrix in terms of R, not in terms of X. So we have to define the gradients in terms of local coordinates. So we know what the value of the uh, D matrix is. It's just going to be equal to, so this value here is just going to be hydraulic conductivity. So it's nothing more than that. I guess that's this. Right, so that's our K matrix, just a single value. And now uh, the essence of what we did before was we defined a, a shape function. And so what does this shape function uh, look like? This really is going to conform to exactly what we talked about last time, and that is that we want it to conform to be one at the node in question. I don't really have enough space here, so I'll do it over here. Actually, let me do it on either side of this. So this is what the shape functions would look like. If I can do it. Not very good at all. Don't do that yet. <laughs> Start. Uh, that's a bit better. Yeah. So this magnitude here is one. This magnitude here is one. This is r. This is zero. This is plus one. This is minus one. And this would be B1, and this is B2. And so these are the mapping functions. You remember this? Uh, I know you're maybe trying to get that down, but you might remember, if we zip back, this uh, the tent geometry that we had a long time ago uh, in terms of defining behavior in, in this. This is the geometry. And so we talked about these individual functions that had to have this requirement that they had to equal 1 at the node in question. This is B1. At node 1, it equals 1. But at nodes 2, 3, and 4, it has to equal, it has to equal 0. That was our requirement. And so we're really just re-emphasizing uh, re that. So this expression here does exactly that. It's 1 at the node in question. So B1 is 1 at the node in question. This is node 1, and this is node 2. And likewise, B2 is 1 at node 1, sorry, 1 at the location of node 2, and 0 at the location of node 1. And so if you write the equations for each one of these, we get this. this these are the shape functions. This is B1. This is B2. And so in other words, when r is equal to minus 1, uh, this is minus 1. Minus 1 minus minus 1 is 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. So it's equal to 1 at that location. When r is equal to plus 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. And so it's equal to 0. And it just scales linearly between that. So you can show that for yourself. So those are the shape functions. And we made the case before when we talked about we spent more time talking about this than we needed to, about subparametric elements and superparametric elements, is that we can use shape functions to map both the geometry and also the variable. And so that's exactly what we're going to attempt to do now, is that we could imagine mapping the geometry in terms of this shape function. So we can multiply 
the shape function by the nodal values, the x coordinates, the x coordinates of the nodal nodes, uh, and that will give us the location of x at any point. And we can also do it for the, this is probably more obvious, if you have the head magnitudes and you choose a shape function here, you can get the value of the head. And so all this is saying that if you choose some location within the element, which happens to be this point here, say r is equal to minus a half, then if you now put r equals minus a half into each of these expressions, you'll get a number. I should have chosen a, a better number. What, what would it be? If it's minus a half, then this would be uh, minus minus a half. This would be 3 over 2, right? This would be 3 quarters, which would make sense, right? This is 1, this is 3 quarters, this is a half, this is a quarter, this is um, 0. And so all it does is it gives you two values for this. This would be 3 quarters, what would this be? This would be a quarter, right? So this would be 3 over 4, this would be 1 over 4. And so all it would do is if you took the values of whatever the heads are at this node, at these nodes, and multiplied through by first three quarters by the value of h1 and one quarter by the value of h2, it would give you whatever the head should be mapped across here. It would actually be no different than taking this geometry where we had, if you remember, um, not running out of space here, remember we had h2 and h1, we had the head mapped linearly between those. And if we're taking this location, which is at r is equal to minus a half, then it would give you this value here. And it would do it by taking the value of the shape function here for b1 multiplied by whatever the head is at this location, and the value for the shape function b2 multiplied by the value of this head. It's just weighting those magnitudes. And I probably should have. So, well, why don't I do that? So, in other words, it would give you the value of head at this location. It would be equal to, uh, if we use this value, it would be 3 over 4 and 1 over 4. This is just B1 and B2. This stuff here. And multiplied by H1 and H2. Uh, which is the same as just saying that it's equal to 3 over 4 times h1 plus 1 over 4 times h2. So it's really the same as, as this geometry that we had before, where this was uh, the coordinate, but it's just doing it in a slightly different way. And I suppose the only other interesting thing about this is that not only are we using this to map the nodal variable across the element, but we're also using it to map the geometry. So in this case, x is equal to or the transpose of x is, is this. So it's, in other words, we just put x1 and x2, which would be the nodes of these elements there. Okay. So um, now, what do we need to do? So what we have is that we have a constituent relationship, which we have. We need to figure out two properties, right? We need to figure out what the A matrix would look like, and we have to figure out what this determ this mapping parameter, this determinant of Jacobian, should be. So let's try and figure out exactly what that is. We know, for instance, that the definition of the A matrix is that it's something that maps nodal heads onto gradients of those heads. We only have one dimension in this along the axis of the element, and it's the x direction in the global form. And so we know how to take the magnitudes of nodal heads and map them onto the gradient. If we knew how to do that, we'd have this matrix. But what we've done here is we've changed this from being dx. Now we're doing it in terms of, these have to be defined in terms of r, because that's what the integration variable is. So instead of, this is what defines our A matrix, defined in terms of this global gradient, dh dx, but we're not going to be able to use that because we're going to have to do this integration using R. So how can we deal with that? Well, 
we can take, we'd like to get dh dx, uh, but we can only get that in a roundabout way by splitting it up like this. And so we could take this and we could just multiply it by 1. 1 would be the same as dr over dr, right? These two together is just dr over dr, it's just 1. But what this has done in splitting it this way, basically the chain rule, right? Nothing other than that, is now if we know exactly this is what we'd want to be able to define our head gradient in, which we can, because we've now written our equations in this in this local geometry. So we're probably going to be able to get this. And then this is just this transformation. And the interesting thing about this is that if you look at this, these components here, then basically this is saying that dx is equal to this determinant over the Jacobian times dr. And so if you rearrange that, this basically says that this determinant, the Jacobian, is equal to <coughs> dx over dr. And so in other words, this is the property we like to get. This is just going to be the inverse of this. This is just going to be 1 over So we've said that we're going to have to figure out exactly what that is. Well, we've kind of already defined it. If we know what, if we take the derivatives of, of this, we in, immediately have this value. So anyway, so that's what's going on at the bottom here. So uh, we want to be able to calculate the A matrix. The A matrix links the nodal values of heads to the global gradient, which we don't have. And so we have to manipulate this in some way to be able to get this global gradient defined in terms of local coordinates. That's exactly what this is here. And so what we'd like to be able to do is, bless you, define each of these two terms. Bless you. How do we get this? How do we get this? So this is the first one. So this is the first one here. We want to get the gradient of head with this. We know that we define head according to this, this expression here. And so we can get this magnitude of head merely by the shape function. This is the head at any point within the element, and it's defined as the shape function multiplied by the nodal values of head, simply enough. We know that the nodal values of head are only defined at the nodes. They don't get distributed over the element, so this can come outside of the differentiation. And so the differentiation just refers to the, the differentiating the shape function. We know what the shape functions are. They're off the top of this screen. But we can differentiate each of these with respect to r. And so if we do that, then what are the, what are the derivatives of each of these? Again, I'm running out of space. So db dr is equal to a half multiplied by, what's the derivative of this with respect to r? It's just minus 1. What's the derivative of this with respect to r? It's just plus 1. And so we have this derivative here. So we need to get this derivative. And so b prime is what we're calling it. And we've done it up here. And this is just this, this expression. So this is b prime, which is also, it's not a, is it? I was going to call it a, but it's not. It's just the derivatives of the shape functions. So we said that we need two of these things. We want to get this. We have the first one, which is this. Now we need to get the second one. Um, yeah, OK. So that's this. Whoops. And. Um, so this second term is just how r changes with x, dr dx. And so dr dx is this, which is just the inverse of dx dr, just 1 over. And so in other words, if we know how to get the derivative of x, 
then we take one over that, we have this. So what is x? Well, we had it defined up in this expression here. Number five, equation five. This defines nodal value, location x as a function of shape functions and the nodal values of x. And so in other words, we could just substitute this as x is equal to b x. Nodal values of coordinates, uh, the shape function, and this is this. I guess that's basically this here. And in other words, since this, again, you can apply the same rationale. It's the derivative of this expression. The x values are only applied at the nodes individually. They don't vary over the element. So the only differentiable component of this is going to be this value of b. And so dr, dr dx is just the derivative of the shape functions, which we already know, multiplied by the magnitudes of the node, nodal coordinates, and 1 over that value. And so this, if you like, is the end result for part 2. This is this, dhdr. Um, this is the end result for part one. So this here. And we want to get the product of these two. So this one and this one multiplied together. To keep them on the same screen, it's going to be this. This is. This part here is 1, this part here is 2, and the product of them together gives us this value. So let's just go back and look at this. So we wanted to get, we know, so the, the idea here is we want to be able to, we know that the parameter that links the nodal values of heads to their gradients in the global space is this A matrix. That's what we need. If we want to get this magnitude, we, can, we can't get it in terms of x because we've defined our mapping functions in terms of this local coordinate r. So what we can do is we can define this not in terms of x, as in here, but we can do it in terms of dh dx, which are these terms, multiplied by 1 over 1. If we do some substitution to use the mapping of these functions here for both heads and geometry, into these values of x and h for these various ones, which is what we've done, then we can define each of these terms 1 and 2. If we can define each of these terms 1 and 2, then we, when we take the product of them down here, then by definition we have dh dx. And if dh dx is linked to the value of the nodal magnitudes of heads, by definition the rest of this term is the A matrix, which is what we want. So it's a bit convoluted, but uh, um, but that's really what we're trying to do. And so now we know that, for instance, uh, b prime is equal to a half minus one plus one, which occurs here, occurs twice here. And so now we should be able to to use that to be able to to calculate what this is. And I guess the further the the other part of this is what? Is that um, b prime x is going to be equal to a half minus 1 plus 1 multiplied by x1 x2. And this is this is this uh, second part here. And so uh, if you write that out in longhand, this is just equal to a half um, x2 minus x1. And so what is x2 minus x1? This is just equal to a half L, right? x2 is the furthest coordinate. Uh, x1 is the nearest coordinate, 
subtract x1 from x2, it's just the distance between them, which is the length of the element, and you divide that by 2, because that term is here, then you have that. And so I think that's that's basically, so this, this would be This term here is this. And this term here is this. <coughs> and actually, this two is associated with this as well. But the bottom line is, I suppose, uh, is that now we have a matrix, which is the A matrix, which is now uh, defined uh, in the system. So we know, if we go back up to the top, we know exactly what this matrix is that we're going to use here. We've just figured out what it is. And so now the only term that we don't quite know what it is yet is this determinant the Jacobian. But actually, we do know what it is, right? Because it's just equal to, um, if just from this arrangement that we did here, the Jacobian is just equal to the ratio of these two. And so what we could do is we could substitute, I'm running out of space, but we could substitute the value of x being equal to bx, right? Nodal values of coordinates, shape functions, the value of x at any point within the element, substitute in this, and then take the derivative of this with respect to r. And so this would then be just b prime, right? have that somewhere down here. Same calculation here. So we can make this connection up at the top of the page. We know exactly what this is. It's just the derivative of this. We can substitute in here the fact that x is equal to bx, nodal values, shape functions. And so the, again the differentiation occurs only on this component because x is the nodal values only exist at the nodes, they're not distributed over the element. And we have this. So this is the value of our Jacobian, which in this case is just equal to L over 2. And so now we have the determinant of the Jacobian, which is this J prime term. We have the value for A, which is this. And those are the two components we need in this, this last part. Oops, sorry, I'll leave it there. And if we do the substitutions, then uh, A transpose is this. The constitutive matrix, Darcy's law, is this. Just a scalar value. And just A on its own is this. We have the magnitude of the determinant of Jacobian, which we've said is this, just L over 2. Oh, can't go from one to another, but close enough. And it's integrated. And so if you do this matrix multiplication, you end up with a matrix that looks like this, and uh, which is this term outside, which is a factor of 2 different from what we're used to having, right? It's got 1 over 2 instead of just AK over L. And the integrations are on these. In this case, it's a pretty trivial integration. So if you want to calculate what the integral is of any one of these, just take one of them. Uh, for instance, this one. Just take 1 plus 1 dr. And the integral of that is just r evaluated between plus 1 and minus 1. If you substitute the limits from here, it's uh, plus 1 minus minus 1, which is plus 2. And if you substitute the plus 2s to so this, immediately becomes a k over 2 L and then these individual parts will be 2 minus 2 sorry minus 2 and 2 and if you get rid of these terms I can't really do that right so if you cancel out the 2 over 2's you end up with this this matrix here and so not surprisingly, we end up with exactly the same result as before. So it's not a, um, a futile exercise. It was to demonstrate the point that we can actually do this. And so the big picture is, is really the fact that 
in attempting to do this, what we are trying to do is merely go back through this and you know, perhaps reiterate what, what exactly we've done. It's a bit muddled here. We want to be able to calculate the conductance matrix in this um, modified geometry. We need to be able to define the A matrix in the, this mapping term. The A matrix is always defined in terms of the relationship between the nodal values of heads and their global derivatives, dh dx. But the integration we have to do here is with respect to r. So we can't just use the values of x. We have to define them as a function of r. And so we split it up in some way to be able to do that. And then we end up with the, the resulting uh, expressions. And so maybe it's not so uh, surprising that we get exactly the same uh, result. You'd probably expect that if, if you think about it, because uh, you know the one thing that we did in this that maybe is the same as before is that when you look at the values of these, um, if you looked at the shape functions we had, you could think of the shape functions kind of like this H2 and H1. Or actually, these are multiplied by B2, right? So the products of the shape functions multiplied by the, the nodes, nodal values, would look like this. H1, in our other case, was lower than H2. And before, how we represented this geometry was that this, instead of being R, was actually X. And the mapping function that we used was just this. So this is isoparametric. And this was, if you like, normal, I guess. Or non-parametric. I guess I'm not sure what the right term would be for it. But um, the, the only difference between what we did yesterday in choosing a shape function, which was h is equal to h1 plus x over l h2 minus h1, which is what we used yesterday. And what we did today, which is the fact that h is equal to bh, which is the same as b1 h1 plus B2, H2. These are really equivalent to each other in some respects. This X over L is kind of a dimensionless number. It goes from 0 to 1 along the length, right? When X is equal to 0, it's e X over L is equal to 0. When X is equal to L, then X over L is equal to 1. And so the, the relative mapping is between 0 and 1. Yeah, actually worthwhile plug that. This is between 0, so x over L is between 1 and 0. x is 1 and L. And in this geometry, in terms of r, this is minus 1 and this is plus 1. So they're just kind of different ranges of parameters. But really it's the same. Uh, it happens to be the same in this case. Uh, and you, we notice that it is the same because the value of this Jacobian ends up being uh, a constant. So in other words, in this particular case, this mapping function we have here is exactly the same as if we just take the full length of the elements. dx is equal to L, and dr is equal to 2. And so we can actually get it just from that simple ratio. What that physically means is if you look at any point within this element here, any a small length, then the stretching or the squeezing that occurs to be able to map this geometry onto this geometry is uniform. And so I suppose you could draw it like uh, if this was the real element length uh, 
L. And this was this reduced geometry, which is 2. Then basically, the fact that this mapping coefficient is constant all the time means that when you map these down, this maps to this point here, this maps to this point here, but also any other portion of this also maps to the same ratio of length in here. Everything just gets um, transformed, squeezed or stretched by the same amount. So in other words, you have this big element, you squeeze it down, every single portion of it gets squeezed down by the same amount to be able to fit it onto this smaller system. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, I don't know whether we'll have time to do it here, uh, but we could choose elements that are much more, um, much fancier than these. And so the fancier elements, actually we do have a, a, some pictures, I'll just go to those. <coughs> Maybe it's already passed. This, yeah, this. So for instance, we could choose elements that look like this. So this top element is now our element, which would be um, of length L. And if we were to do that with only two nodes, then we'd have no option but to be able to take this uh, isoparametric mapping and put transform it, I guess, from one to the other, so it's a one-to-one -one mapping. So in other words, to take this bar that's L and to put it on this two-unit long element, we have to stretch it uniformly. That's the only option we have if we have these simple shape functions, which are defined just like as a, a linear with two shape functions with two magnitudes. But you could imagine, for instance, that we put intermediate nodes in here, Let's just think about one node. And this intermediate node could, for instance, be equivalent to, um, say, the, whoops, say, the middle point here. Oops. And so if this intermediate point was mapping uh, the geometry of this uh, mapped element onto the real elements, then clearly, if you look at a length on here relative to a length on here versus a length on here to a length on here, then no longer are these in the same ratios, right? Because this, this length here relative to this length is different from this length here relative to this length. And so in this case, the magnitude of this Jacobian which is definitely equal to, was it dx dr or? Uh, yes, dx over dr. Because this mag length dr and dx are different at each location, then it is not constant along elements. And so you can think of this Jacobian, it really is a scalar value. All it's doing is saying, what do you have to multiply um, dr by to get this, this magnitude of dx? That's what it's saying. It's saying, what's the proportion you have to do to be able to stretch it into dx, simply. And so because this length here, the ratio of this length here to this length, and is not equal to this ratio of this length to this length, then this magnitude has to, by definition, change along the length. And so we actually do get that result out of it. We just have to make sure that when we calculate this uh, determinant, the Jacobian, that we really do use d dr of x. And this value of x is equal to the shape functions multiplied by the nodal values. And clearly, in this case, if we have three nodes, then this would be x is equal to b1, b2, b3, multiplied by the x-coordinates of node 1, the x-coordinates of node 2, 
and the x-coordinates of node 3. And so in this particular case, we have th three terms, and we can represent it by not a linear shape functions, but by quadratic shape functions. And we're really going beyond where we should be. Uh, I'm not going to mention that. I, I think the only point I wanted to make is that it turned out in this very simple example that this term for the determinant of the Jacobian is actually constant within the element. That is not necessarily the case. Uh, but it's good to look for a physical reason why that is. And the physical reason is this, is that in our mapping that we used for the simple one-dimensional element with two nodes, looked like this element uh, R versus X. And because it has two nodes in it, by definition, when you make this transformation, every portion of this element gets stretched by the same amount in making this transformation. If we have different lengths, of, different forms of stretching to move from the real element to the mapped element, then that's not necessarily true. If that's not necessarily true, then this, this is always true, but this is not necessarily a constant on the length of it. And so um, that's really all I wanted to to say today. Um, what we'll talk about next, uh, which I think is uh, much, there's actually a lot to talk about there, is how we might want to, to do this in more complicated elements. Again, we'll use this obligatory one-dimensional behavior, but in this particular case, you'll recall that our integration that we had to do, which was um, this, this integration was really very trivial because it was a constant. It turns out that if we use more complicated uh, shape functions, this integration is not very not e easy to do analytically at all. And so the reason for using isoparametric elements is it does allow you to be able to use much more complicated element geometries that, for instance, can take curved surfaces. And if you do that, then the integration that you have is typically not a simple integration, but it's actually a, a variable rather than a constant that you're integrating. And if that's the case, then you have to use something else other than just um, straightforward analytical integration. And so uh, in the next session, we'll talk about doing these for slightly more complicated elements where we have to use numerical integration.